Hi everybody, this is Joanne with Read Science and I'm joined today by my co-host Jeff who is sitting all the way in Maryland and I'm in <laughs> Illinois and our guest is in Hawaii. So we spread out the time zones today. Um, and we like to talk to authors about uh, the books they have written and how they communicate science to the general public. And uh, we have one of the more popular online science communicators with us, Christy Wilcox. She has been on our show before with the book Scientific Blogging along with Bethany Brookshire and Jason Goldman. So but we are going to talk to her today about her book, Venomous. And I hear I'm supposed to ask you about the cover about this particular species. So, um, but her book is How Earth's Deadliest Creatures Mastered Biochemistry. And um, I really enjoyed it. Um, definitely say hi to everybody, Christy. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> so Christy is currently on the crazy book tour type thing where you're at all different, uh, you know, uh, media type outlets or interviews and things like that, right? Getting the book promoted, but you're you're still in Hawaii where you do research. Yes, right now I'm still in Honolulu for a little bit longer. Um, looking forward to the World Conservation Congress here coming up in about a week. Uh, so I'm here. Is the Congress going to be in Hawaii or is it? Yeah, some... yeah, it's in Honolulu, which is really awesome. It's the first time it's the IUCN conference, and it's the first time it's been in America. Period. Oh, so really wow. exciting. Yeah. Wow. Well, let me do a quick bio, official bio of Christy before uh, Jeff throws out the first question. All right, so, um, okay, Chris, Dr. Christy Wilcox is a scientist, science writer, and social media specialist. Uh, she obtained her PhD in 2014 in cell and molecular biology, yay, with a specialization in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She currently pens the Science Sushi blog for Discover Magazine. Through her writing, Dr. Wilcox shares her insatiable enthusiasm for biology, and she is renowned in the science blogosphere for her delicate balance of contemporary science and scientific perspective seasoned with just the right amount of wit. And I agree. So I won't, I won't read any more, but that's, that's you. <laughs> yeah, that's great bio. I wonder who wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds just like me. So, <laughs> welcome, Christy. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Let's let's get this started. Okay. And I'll there, do some tweeting. There, there's some uh, some stuff I want to get into that's a little bit deeper, and I, I like it sometimes when I can start with the you know the really profound question, but I wanted to to start with a with a sort of simple place and give you the real softball question and say, to get started, I'd like to review the differences between venomous and poisonous and toxic. Because Good those question. are easily confused, and they can all do bad stuff to you. But for what we're going to talk about, it's, it's really good to have a solid idea of what it means to be venomous. Right, right. So a lot of people use those words very interchangeably. But scientifically speaking, they have different meanings. So Toxic or toxin is sort of the big category. That's anything that in a sort of small, relevant dose causes significant physiological harm. So anything that would cause you to, I don't know, bleed out or <laughs> have your heart rate increase massively or, or something like that. Most pharmaceuticals, actually, if you think about it, would be considered toxins in that respect because they cause a very significant physiological response in a small dose. We then have. you have, sort of branching from toxin, you have venom and poison. So a poison is anything that is ingested, absorbed, or inhaled. So you're thinking passively entering your body, right? Or you're the one doing the action. So if you bite a frog and you get sick, then that's a poisonous frog. Venom, on the other hand, is a very active toxin. And so what happens is it is any toxin that is introduced through wounding. And so if they bite you and hurt you, like a snake, they're venomous. So there's these main two categories. My third, there's a third category that I really like, just because I think it's a fun word, um, which is toxungenous. And that, <laughs> Unginous. Yeah, toxungenous. And that's essentially poisonous with purpose. So if you think of something that actively shoots a poison at you or, you know, points mm. a poison towards you, 
then that's a toxungenous animal. So these definitions get a little bit interesting when you try to apply them to animals because you have something like a spitting cobra when biting you is venomous, when spitting at you is toxungenous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. And now, in, in biological language, venoms are, what should we say, a collection of proteins? Not just proteins. So they're a chemical cocktails. Usually okay. toxic chemical cocktails. So they can include proteins, and usually do. Um, they can include small molecules, things like acetylcholine or uh, other sort of really strong, potent signaling molecules. They can include lipids. They can include fats. So there's a lot of sort of inflammatory pathways, for example, in your body that are turned on by having little tiny fats running around. So they could contain all sorts of things. Because you said you wrote one thing, and you know I'm sort of in a habit of writing down short quotations and then forgetting why I wrote them down. <laughs> but you said, I think you were going to start describing a thing. You said, ah, what makes a good venom protein? Yeah. <laughs> I think we were going to talk about evolutionary things, which is where I'm headed anyway. Mm -hmm. but, but you were talking about proteins that have particular types of functions, and maybe a quick overview of those functions for some context before the evolution, because later on I want to talk about silicon channel blockers too. Yeah, so there are sort of seen, there's, depending on who you ask, two to three main categories of venoms. The two big ones are neurotoxic venoms, which means they attack neurons and are signaling cascade and, generally speaking, cause paralysis as their main mode of death. And then there are hematoxic, which means they attack the blood. And so these are things that are going to cause steep increases or drops in blood pressure to cause the potential prey to faint, um, or potentially anticoagulants to cause them to bleed out. Um, some people would also add a third category, which is cytotoxic, which means they cause massive wounding and necrosis. They tend to be sort of packaged along with hematoxic, and it's kind of hard to separate the two. It's a lot of things that cause, you know, blood cells to rupture, for example, also might cause skin cells to rupture. But, yeah, so those are the three main categories. Although, when you get to a, a sort of cell molecular level, a lot of them sort of operate in similar ways, even though there are a number of mechanisms, right? I expect yep. we'll, we'll get to those. But So what, what you're talking about, you're sort of uh, dividing them up by what effect rather than mechanism, really. Yes, yes. And that's actually how I divided the book up. Um, one of the things that I find really most fascinating about venoms is the fact that you have a snake and a snail and a jellyfish, and they all can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. ultimately speaking. Mm -hmm. And so trying to draw connections between these very diverse groups of animals, I chose to, instead of having a chapter on snakes and a chapter on cone snails and a chapter on spiders, yeah. I wanted yeah. to show the similarities. So I structured the chapters around activities rather than around the animals. You want yeah, I like that. Say, I like that. that. In, yeah, that was effective organization because right. it had variety but coherence. But anyway, so we're, the question then is... is is going to keep coming up of whether it's a convergent evolution to what extent. But with that, with an evolution question in mind, you mentioned one thing that was exciting and new to me because I hadn't realized it and it opens up um, ideas uh, for how evolutionary change happens and selection can operate. You said there are three ways for genomes to get altered. The one that everyone thinks they know about is mutations. And they all think they understand mutations. They may not, but they've heard of it. Then there are insertions and deletions that some of us have already heard about and thinks because that's really cool. A lot of stuff happens. And I don't know that I've heard so much specifically about duplications before. Mm -hmm. And just in passing here maybe, but if, if you could talk about duplications because I was really excited by the idea of of how versatile a method that is for trying out new things when there are, you know, is a, an evolutionary bottleneck or a lot of pressure going on. That can make things happen quickly. Yeah, gene duplications are actually probably, I would say, the most important in the uh, sort of evolutionary mechanism in the development of venoms and, and toxins in general because 
a lot of these toxins are or come from very important compounds and chemicals in our bodies. So things that already do these very important jobs, like increase our blood pressure or decrease our blood pressure or, you know, cause us to start a clot or cause us to bust a clot. Like those, those very important physiological processes, there are all these enzymes and proteins and peptides that do that for us naturally. And so the gene duplication events are really what make open up the ability to be toxic because you have that starting precursor and now you have an extra one, something that you can then do whatever you want with in, in an evolutionary sense. If it becomes non-functional, it's not hurting you anymore. And so... And this is this is literally duplication you're talking about, where a, a string of, of the DNA that codes for a protein gets duplicated. Yep. So it's it's an accident essentially in the duplication process. So when the mm -hmm. enzymes are going through and and taking apart those DNA strands and copying them, sometimes they basically catch and rerun, and so you end up with a different one, or they grab the wrong piece somehow and add a gene in the middle. That shouldn't be there. So you end up with these duplica duplications and these extra genes that are otherwise fully functional. They have all the parts they need. Uh, does the, the, does the duplication process itself uh, more frequently come with errors? Can things happen during that that process? It can happen during it as well. Oh. Uh, I mean, so, so yeah, you can have a, a, a bad <laughs> duplication, essentially. So you have a duplication that then has mutations or an indel. Or you can have a partial duplication, which is um, actually a way to get some of these secret, uh, secreted proteins, right? Mm -hmm. So you have normally a section of the protein that says, this is going to bind into the membrane and stick here in the cell. Um, and then it's going to do its thing. But if you cut that off accidentally in a duplication event, then you have a protein that might still work, but be free to flow around and go and to try new things. And that yeah. doesn't necessarily turn off the previous protein, at least not exactly, yet. Exactly, exactly. So that's the point. That's what it's makes not it that open. risky a, a trial, is it? Right. Uh, that's what makes yeah. it open. And especially if you have things like the cone snails, they're notorious for these gene duplications. Once they had their toxins sort of these these conotoxins going, they duplicate them faster than any species duplicates any section of DNA that we've discovered on Earth. And some of these are probably non-functional. They might be mistakes, essentially, that, that then just get lost in evolutionary history. But the fact that they can keep duplicating those genes and tweaking them and tweaking them and tweaking them has allowed them to change from being uh, worm hunters to snail hunters to fish hunters and being able to open up that prey diversity. Right. You know what? Uh, reading this book, so I teach uh, a couple courses on genomics usually focusing on the human genome, but people always ask, well, why is the Human Genome Project important? Well, yes, it's important for humans, but actually what this did was open up, I mean, we had massive advances in the technology to do genomic sequencing, and as I'm reading this book, I'm like, what a fascinating way to talk about the field of genomics, mm -hmm. because right. it com must have completely changed how you guys study toxins. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean. Incredible. I mean, and, and the ability, really what it did mostly is open up the ability to study anything. anything. Because up until the genomics revolution, you could, you could study snakes. I mean, they give you these large doses of venom that you can milk from them regularly, and so you can, you can play your biochemical, <laughs> be a biochemist and play with them and separate them out. And that's fairly straightforward. But when you're talking about some of the spiders, right, you're talking about, like, spiders, or the cone snails, or some of these other animals that have, I mean, you're talking picoliters of venom mm -hmm. right. at a time, or something like that, jellyfish even. I mean, getting a lot of jellyfish venom is hard. And so being able to, to create a genome and create a transcriptome and then look back and say, okay, well, what is being expressed here? What kinds of genes are these? Might these be toxins? What, you know, that, that has completely changed what species we can study. Right. It, I mean, it was amazing, and even then, you know, they've used genomics, the new, uh, you know, total genome sequencing is an incredible way to see uh, evolutionary relationships. Mm -hmm. it just through, through that completely, you know, it's like, wow, look what we can do, and, and then even for species that produce toxins, another thing I got from your book is the diversity, incredible diversity. Yeah. And as you said, they're using... Every trick in the book. 
and, yeah. and now with genomics, you're able to sort of go in and tease apart which one right. is more likely for this species and not. Right, so you can see all these different things, and you can see the convergence, and there is a lot of convergent evolution where you have these proteins that are from very different species that look very similar, and you can tell that they all came from perhaps the same initial protein and were all co-opted by, by these animals to become venoms. And that's really interesting, and, and you were talking about that idea of a, what's a good protein for a venom. I mean, the fact that the same protein families get picked up and duplicated mm -hmm. over and over and over again and suggests that there is some level of constraint where there is a good venom protein, in a sense, versus okay. a bad venom protein, because we have so many protein families that don't end up showing up in venoms. But that also suggests, right, that... Uh, if, if you're the creature who is doing all these uh, gene duplications and testing out various mutations and random things, that uh, there are certain types of mechanisms, certain types of proteins, and certain types of uh, vulnerabilities in your prey's uh, biological structure, yeah. physiology, to attack that, that those things are just going to be uh, uh, selected more frequently, aren't they? Right, and I think, I think part of that is that there just are certain parts of our bodies or certain pathways in our bodies that are so essential that if your goal is to stop me dead in my tracks, mm -hmm. this is the thing to do, right? I mean, paralysis, when you stop neurons from functioning, you're stopping me. There's, no, there's nothing I can do about it. If you turn off my neurons, I'm done. <laughs> and the fact that you want to do it quickly is usually right. important. and you want to do it quickly, and you want to do it whatever. There's lots of ways to kill me, sure, <laughs> but there's mm -hmm. only certain ways that kill me quickly, or at least stop me quickly. Something like um, causing a drop in blood pressure will cause my brain to lose the amount of blood it needs to function properly, and I'll pass out. I'm not dead yet. I might recover from that pretty quickly, but I passed out for just the wrong amount of time. <laughs> Although not. there are some, like these, these wasps, who don't kill the right. the uh, what oh. caterpillars, <laughs> but just immobilize them, right? Uh, oh, the, the parasitoid wasps are one of the greatest venomous animals in my. They're, in they're my creepy. Opinion. They're creepy. <laughs> they're wonderfully creepy. They're amazingly <laughs> creepy. I mean, the things that they are able to do. It's amazing because Jeff, the last three guests have all talked about this in their books. <laughs> yes. So it was in Ed Young's book. It was in Karen's book. Parasitic <laughs> in wasps. Book. Yeah, parasitic wasps. I'm like, okay, we have a popular <laughs> theme well, here. Well, they're really fascinating. And, and they the are. fact that they can do what they do with venom, to me, that's what makes them really, really special, is that they are, especially when you're talking about injecting venom directly into the insect version of a brain mm -hmm. and, and using that to manipulate not, mm -hmm. not to kill, not to paralyze directly, but to manipulate, to get them to do what they want them to do, and to be essentially passively willing to donate their bodies to feed the young of the swaths. I mean, that, that to me is just mind-blowing, and it makes you wonder, what is evolutionarily possible <laughs> Right, <laughs> what the else animal? has been done, we didn't know. And actually, this, this brings up a point that we mentioned briefly before we came on air, that your book has some really scary things, creepy things, <laughs> but, like, actually, when I read it, I didn't feel scared or creeped out, well, maybe a little creeped out, little but creepy. I didn't feel scared, and, and you just have a really nice way of writing, and as Jeff actually said, comfy, and I, I mm -hmm. can say that, comfortable, like, because this book could have been sensationalized, you could have been trying to go for, you know, let's activate everybody's limbic system and get them scared, and worried that at every corner they're going to encounter a snake, but you had a way of writing that made it accessible. But, you know, I, almost like there's the comfort of science to say, you know, we're trying to understand this. I, I don't know, but maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit more. I mean, I don't know if someone else has told you before it's comfortable, but, you know. Uh, it's like, not what a word. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's wonderful. Um, for me, what was part of important was really to not make it scary because these animals are feared by a lot of people and a lot of people have very strong fears and strong feelings about these animals and what I wanted to show was how amazing and incredible they are and sort of bring back some of what our ancient cultures used to have 
which is this reverence of sorts for these animals. And the idea that they, they should be respected, yes, and respected for the fact that they are dangerous and that you don't want to go around messing with venomous snakes or spiders or any of these other things. But also to say that they shouldn't be hated. They're these anim the, the phrase that I use is the animals that, love, that we love to hate. <laughs> and I think that that's a little bit sad because they're amazing animals and they do incredible things. And they are very important in their ecosystems and in their habitats in terms of the balance of our food webs and things like that. So the fact that we end up hating them and then end up, unfortunately, often sort of killing them without thinking about it, um, that, that was a very important point for me to try to get across, was to take away some of the fear and to, to replace it with respect. Yeah. Which you did, and I wrote down a couple things to, to mention for, for us humans who have evolved with notoriously bad risk assessment uh, capabilities. Uh, I noted you, you, you wrote down, and these are 100 pages apart in the book almost, but you said there are about 100,000 snake bites, I think this is around the world, in a year, with 20,000 deaths in a year. It's like, this is, this is an enormous number of people really dying um, from toxic, uh, from venomous situations, although 20,000 people is small out of 7 billion, but it still sounds like a big number. On the other hand, you said um, there are 8,000 venomous snake bites a year in the US, and that they're mostly rattlesnakes, but that fewer than 12 are fatal, which is like, Okay, avoid the rattlesnakes, but there are situations that are really a lot worse if you're going to stay awake at night worrying about them, right? Right, and and that's one of the things that, that we have a very strong fear of snakes in general in the U.S. to the point that people do these rattlesnake roundups and kill hundreds of them in a day or two Yeah. in, in places like Texas and, and a lot of in the south. Uh, and yet they're really, on the big scale of things, kind of harmless to us. I mean, yeah, they would hurt, and it costs a lot of money to get the antivenom, to get the medical care, to, to make it through. But when you think about the kinds of snakes that are in other parts of the world, rattlesnakes are really, really not that bad. I mean, there's a lot of, particularly elapids, when you talk about the cobras and the crates. I mean, these are, these are snakes that kill very efficiently, very quickly, and, and they live in parts of the world where they don't have the wonderful medical care mm -hmm. that we keep. Yeah. whining about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you think about our medical care, the idea that if you get bitten by a cobra somewhere in rural India, you're not going to get to a hospital with antivenom within a day, perhaps. I mean, that's just not necessarily going to happen. And that's that's why a lot of these deaths occur. Or you have places like Africa where the antivenom supplies have dwindled and they're not even making any more of some of the most important ones. And so mm -hmm. you're running out of these life-saving medicines and there's not a whole lot <laughs> fixing that immediately. I mean, there's a lot of scientists trying to fix it and working on it, but there's yeah, a yeah. crisis right now where people are dying because the medicines just aren't there, aren't getting to them. At the right time, yeah. Right. But you did point out that primates, including humans, have evolved to be afraid of snakes and to be pretty good at recognizing snakes, but not necessarily the venomous ones. Right, right. Yeah, so there's one of my favorite hypotheses related to venom is the snake detection hypothesis, and that's by Lynn Isbell. And the idea being that early on in the lineage of primates, long before we split from the other apes and even some of the monkeys, that snakes were a major predator, and they became very, very venomous very quickly. And so as any predator-prey relationship, there was sort of this evolutionary pressure you might call it, to do something about the fact that there are snakes, right? And evolving resistance to venom, shockingly, is actually very difficult and, and extremely expensive, and it only happens in a few cases. So rather than evolving resistance to venom, for whatever reason, uh, our lineage instead ended up investing in eyesight and the idea of seeing snakes. If you see them first and you can run from it and not get bitten, especially these ambush sort of predators when they're sitting there and camouflaged. If you can see them sitting there, you know not to go near, and you can just walk away. And so by developing eyesight, we inadvertently essentially developed brains because image processing costs a lot of brain power. And so being able to see in color, being able to see you know, in sharp 3D, all of these sort of adjustments that the primates made to their eyesight ended up 
giving us bigger brains and setting us on a path to have bigger and bigger brains and potentially leading to the fact that we are the intelligent animals that we are today. Interesting. Yeah, that was a very fascinating part of the book. And, you know, because I've read many books where they, they toss out why do we have color vision, why do we, you know. But right. this was the first time I ever heard that. Yeah, and I mean, there is definitely some very intriguing evidence for it. I mean, looking at comparisons between primates that stayed around snakes throughout the entire evolutionary history and the ones that made it to the New World and therefore had this sort of gap before mm -hmm. the snakes got there. <laughs> Things like that and how the ones that stayed in Africa have better eyesight than the ones that came to the New World. Things like that. I mean, it's really, really interesting. And, and my favorite is the fact that we can detect snakes before we even know we're detecting snakes. Even babies can detect mm -hmm. snakes in an image, and they do these really, really awesome studies where they flash just, you know, milliseconds of, a, of a, an image in front of you, and you don't cognizantly know what you just saw. You, don't, you can't say, oh, it was a picture of a snake, or it was a picture of a mushroom, or it was a picture of a whatever. Um, but your body physiologically reacts and so you have like things like increases in heart rate or sweating or, or whatever that are only occur when you react to it when you mm. are flashed a snake instead of you know a plant. And these right. obviously then aren't even snakes moving. And those aren't, yeah, and, and we also they have great um, studies with videos of snakes and, and moving snakes, especially with really young babies. And so it seems that this is an innate ability to detect snakes and an innate response to snakes. This goes as far like back into, it's written into our genes. Somehow, somehow, that would be fascinating somehow. to know what exactly that looks like. You know, they must be doing some of that at the U of I because, so when my children were little, I took my son to an infant <laughs> cognition lab. All the kids had gone at some point. And there was one where they're like, we're going to flash in, uh, images of snakes to your son. So this would have been like 23 years ago. So yeah, he was probably know. a part of those studies. Yeah, very, very much so. Because we do have a really good infant cognition lab. So maybe the people who were like interested in the snakes said, well, let's let's coordinate with them. Very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, actually, I wanted to ask. Uh, um, so in your book. You mentioned someone I've been following for a long time, and that's Brian Greig Fry, who, who, you know, you turn on the TV, the venomous animal expert, and he's in the book a lot. So why don't you talk about how, why, why is he in there? For those who don't know who this guy is, well, Brian Fry is 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 perhaps one of the most well-known venom scientists in the world, and he's done a very good job of of getting his research out into the world and putting himself out there in TV specials and um, et cetera to, to really share the science. And he's in there a lot um, in part because he's just been a really fantastic collaborator and and has worked with me a lot on on getting me places or, or helping me get things. Um, for example, I needed uh, some stonefish antivenom for my PhD to do um, I was going to do some Western blotting, which uses the antibodies and the antivenom to see if similar proteins are present in other species. And so I was trying to see if similar proteins were present not only in lionfish, but also in different tissues in lionfish, and kind of examining where that venom, venom proteins, where they are in different parts of the lionfish, and whether or not there was anything that could be learned from that. But I needed the antivenom, and it was, isn't something you could just buy and ship to Hawaii. Sure. Shocker of shockers. And he happened to be coming out here for a conference because they had a big toxinology conference here in 2012. And he carried a vial of stonefish antivenom basically three quarters of the way around the world because he like went off to Russia and was you know hanging out with the woman who's now his wife and, and doing all this stuff. So this vial of antivenom traveled with him up to like four continents or something. And nobody, nobody stopped, stopped him. him. And they sort of shockingly, did. nobody stopped him. It's <laughs> like. Well, the anti-venom is better than the venom, so. Yeah, yeah, and so it was, for me, it was, you know, invaluable to my doctoral dissertation and, and definitely endeared me a little to Brian. <laughs> I mean, it's great. Like I said, I've been following him for a while, so, you know, all his antics and, and you know, someone who dares to go out and get bit and stung and, you know, maybe not purposefully, but. Yeah, no, he's he very, very. about it. <laughs> He's he's just a really really great guy, and he's got 
a hell of a personality. <laughs> it's really fun to write about. Oh, that's so good. Um, you know, I actually saw um, those those of you out there who want to know about unusual poisonings or bacterial infections or viral infections, there's a thing you can subscribe to called the ProMed email and your inbox will be filled every day with the latest outbreaks of diseases, etc. And actually just the other day there was teratodoxin and someone had eaten puffer fish. Like it was sold in a thing and so he didn't die but he was sure six, and you were talking about how dangerous this toxin is. Right, so tetrodotoxin is a really, really interesting neurotoxin because it's used by poisonous animals like puffers, um, and there's salamanders that have it, and it's used as a venom by the blue ringed octopus in particular, okay. um, the, the little species. I love those guys, they're so cute. Uh, <laughs> so tetrodotoxin, I, I, call, I think I call it a brute of a neurotoxin in, in the uh, actual book, but it's one of those things that it shuts off a wide variety, though not all, of uh, sodium channels. And what that ends up doing is just completely stopping neuron signaling in its tracks. So it's a really, really potent paralytic. It's one that we don't have any cure for. So when people get mm -hmm. tetrodotoxin poisoning um, or envenoming from a blue ring octopus, all we can do is essentially try to keep them alive, um, like on an iron lung, essentially, or, or other life support, until the body naturally sort of makes it, makes it through. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that may have been a mistake, Joanne, mentioning tetrodotoxin, because I wrote it down uh, right here as an example of a sodium channel blocker, and the note that I made this, this came two pages after Christie noted that the average cell has a resting potential of minus 70 millivolts. And for both of those, I put, ah, physics. This, is, this excited me, <laughs> of course. But on the way to talking about drugs and things, I wondered if I could get you to tell me in some detail again, because I enjoyed it so much the first time, what a sodium channel is, how it works, so that we can understand how the tetrodotoxin blocks it and why that's a serious but effective strategy. Right. So sodium channels are found in a lot of different cells in our bodies, but perhaps the most important cells that they're found on in is neurons. And what they do is the way that our bodies communicate along neurons involves mm -hmm. the flowing of ions. And so at the very beginning, you have that resting potential, like you said, minus 70 millivolts. And that's really just measuring sort of the positives versus negatives on the inside and the outside, right? And so you have slightly more, you know, negatives or positives on one side or the other. And when you want to send a stimulus, whatever, you know, maybe it's touch neurons responding to something touching you or heat sensing neurons that are responding to you, putting your hand on a fire. Um, what happens is these some ion channels open. And one of the ion channels that opens first is the sodium channel. And so you have a flow of sodium from one side of the cell membrane to the other. And that causes another sodium channel right next to it to go off, doing the same thing. And right next to it to go off, doing the same thing. And right next to it. And it seems like it would be a slow thing, but we can send pulses of electricity, essentially, from our brains to the tips of our fingers in less than a second through that sort of cascading click, 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 yeah. opening, opening and closing. Um, and then, you know, other ion channels open and that one closes and they slowly pump them back into place and that's how you get back to the point where you can send another signal. And this all happens really, really fast in our bodies. But when you shut down these sodium channels, all of a sudden there's no message. Mm -hmm. You just completely shut off that neuron signal. So you, you could be poked and poked and poked and poked and you'll never feel it because it'll never actually reach your brain. And, and things like your muscles won't move. And important muscles, like your diaphragm, won't move, so you won't be able to breathe. Um, or your heart won't contract, things like that. So these, these neuron signals, I mean, they are absolutely paramount of importance. And so when you have toxins like tetrodotoxin that block a lot of sodium channel types, you have a very, very, very dangerous toxin that is effective in many different species of animal. How does the tetrodotoxin cut, cut, interrupt that sodium cascade? 
So it, it actually attaches to a certain part of the channel and basically blocks it. So it, it can't let sodium ions through. I, it, it essentially, yeah, it, it pl I guess plugs it is a good way to say it. It's, it's a little bit complex, but the idea of it plugs it. How's that? <laughs> it's like one of these uh, protein-shaped binding things. Yeah, and it, it's got an active site. I, I think it technically causes a slight conformational change, which makes it not work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's a very, very, like, fits in there. And it's a very small molecule. I mean, tetrodotoxin is a very, very small. And I'm sure this, well, I'm not sure. But it, and probably mentioned, it's one of those things that's really fascinating as well because it is produced by microbes. Mm -hmm. So in all of these species that we know of that have it, none of them produce the tetrodotoxin themselves. None no. of them are capable of making that molecule. So all of them have separately partnered with some sort of um, symbiont, microbiotic symbiont, usually a Vibrio species, right. that that produces their toxin for them. Which right, and Vibrio, of course, is the cholera family. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. the cholera toxin yeah. has different yeah. subunits and, yeah. Which we yep. talked about with Ed a couple of weeks ago. Right. Um, yeah, so we know we know about this. All right, I'm going to think about that for a little bit while Joanne talks about something. <laughs> you know, I, I'm curious, so as Jeff said, he wanted to ask this before we talked about creating the antivenoms, or, or we have sort of two things, of antivenom for particular toxins, but also how can we use these toxins as drugs, right. pharmaceuticals for you know, right. actually healing us? So yeah. the antivenom part, um, creating antivenoms is essentially you taking advantage of particularly mammalian immune systems. And what we do is we inject a small amount of venom into something like a horse or a sheep or even a chicken. They've made them in all sorts of different animals, but so usually a horse. Yeah. yeah, yeah, usually a horse. And your natural um, adaptive immunity and the horse's natural adaptive immunity react to these toxins. So these, um, it turns on our antibody producing cascades. And once they start producing antibodies to bind up these toxins, we can then take that serum, their blood serum, take those antibodies out of it as best we can, and inject them into a person, loosely speaking, and then they continue to bind up the toxins in that person. So we're sort of stealing these antibodies that they're producing to, to fight the venom that we've injected with and using that to save our cells in the case of a bite. And some, there's a few different types of antivenoms. There are ones that are literally the whole antibody. Often they clip off part of the antibody because that's the sort of horse part and trying to minimize the amount of reactions. And then they can even clip off the two arms of the antibody, which are sort of these Y-shaped molecules so that they have the two separate arms that are even less horsey in, in <laughs> nature and, and you know more just the, the actual binding part of the protein. Um, so there's a lot of different varieties on the theme, but the general gist is we steal the antibodies from some animal that we've injected with venom and use them to protect ourselves right. in the case of a bite. And it, are they hoping someday to have almost a, not a universal anti-venom, but maybe groups like protein right. family anti-venoms? Yeah, I mean, the dream would be a universal anti-venom, and part of what they're doing now, originally what they did is just, you know, inject certain species into a, a horse and then use those and say, okay, this is now good against these species. And and it was sort of a very uh, crude process in that sense. Now what they're able to do is really def really refine what they're taking from the, those animals and what they're putting into the person. So they're using these things we call like immunity or immune, uh, well, fancy words. Um, and so what they do is they take the toxins and they stick them on essentially a column or like a, a stick, you know, and then they run these antibodies over them. And then they can only, they can separate the antibodies that stuck from the antibodies that didn't. So these are useless antibodies versus important antibodies. And so they can narrow down which ones they're using um, in that sense. And so they're doing that and, and they can then potentially, you know, immunize eight different horses with eight different venoms, take the most important antibodies from each one, right. mix them together, and then do that. So we're able to do a lot more 
Um, they call it antivenomics and, and this sort of much more complicated process of creating antivenoms to make them more effective against a larger number of species. Right. Uh, and, and then as far as creating pharmaceuticals, tell us right. a little bit about that field because you touched on it in the book. Right. So what's really fascinating about venoms, and, and I mentioned this briefly earlier when I was talking about toxins, is that the difference between a toxin and a, a drug is actually not as much as we'd like to think. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, the, and there's a reason why, you know, you have doses of drugs and they say don't exceed this amount, don't exceed this amount, because what they do in the body is a toxic action if it's done out of control, which, in, you know, when a snake bites you and it causes a drop in blood pressure, that's an out of control drop in blood pressure, that's a problem. But you can take the same toxin that causes that blood pressure drop, you know, use a very small amount of it, and all of a sudden you have a treatment for uh, hypertension for high blood pressure. And that's exactly what happened with Captopril, which came from a pit viper from Brazil. So you have a drug that came from the venom of this animal that took advantage of one of its toxic activities. And we're seeing this more and more in, in pharmaceuticals now that we have all of these genomics tools, now that we have all of these, the ability to create these peptide libraries and, and then you know, use computers to see whether or not they fit into a particular ion channel. Um, we're able to see whether, and, and play with these different venom toxins and see whether or not they might make good pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And there's good reason to believe they would because they do have these potent physiological effects, which is what you need. You want something that does something, right? Yeah. It's, it's useless right. if it doesn't actually do anything. You right. want something that has a very, very potent effect in a very small dose that you can then deliver, hopefully. In, in a meaningful way. And, and with venoms, we know that at least injection usually works. <laughs> That's, if we, these are compounds that are designed to be injected, essentially, right. designed in a loose sense. But they, are, they work from an injection standpoint. So we know that they already, once in our bodies, can do things. And so That's, whether or not you can make a yeah. pill is a whole other question. But there's, there's a start there. And we see things like Prealt, which came from cone snails, which is a, a painkiller for chronic pain. It does need to be injected. At the moment, they haven't made a pill form that makes it really accessible. Right. But for people who have really chronic pain, getting an injection is still way better than suffering. Yeah. Now that we're on drugs, and I want to come back to this point about automatically injectable anyway, but I wanted you to recount one story that you told because, and you'll know where this is going, uh, I'm a diabetic, type 1 as it turns out, my husband is also diabetic. He's type 2. He takes Victoza. It works well for him. And so I told him we have the Gila monster to thank for this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that sounds cryptic enough that you can amaze people by explaining what the Gila monster has to do with diabetics. Right. So the Gila monster um, is this somewhat large uh, <laughs> lizard that lives in the southwestern U.S. And they're, they had been infamous in, in the local lore for their really toxic, awful bites. In reality, their bites hurt a lot, but they're not going to kill you. There's never been a recorded death, for example. Um, but what was interesting is, is back, way back in uh, a couple decades ago, there was a scientist who was looking at how different venom, or looking through different venoms and their effects on the body to try to find something that might work uh, on insulin. And they saw that in, when people injected, I think it was rodents, I don't quite remember, but injected animals with Gila monster venom, there was an enlargement of the pancreas, which is sort of a sign that it might be somehow mm -hmm. acting in the, the immune, or in that section of the system. And so he screened the different toxins in Gila monster venom for their effects and found one, called, which he called Exendin, which actually allows for the sort of stimulated release of insulin over time. And it's very similar to uh, compounds in our own body. But the difference is the one that's in our body and the one that scientists had isolated only lasts for less than an hour. Mm -hmm. So it's a very quick, it's released, it causes the insulin to do its thing, and then it's gone. Oof. And so that doesn't work very well as a drug if you imagine you're trying to take something every hour to try to keep, and, and and so this, this compound, it, it causes the, the correct release of insulin, essentially. It, it allows for the release of insulin without directly releasing insulin by itself. 
And so that's really helpful in diabetes because you're getting the insulin to be released without having to directly say, okay, I'm going to accidentally overshoot it and cause too much insulin release right now. It mm -hmm. just works, makes your body work, basically, how it's supposed to when it comes to insulin release. Um, and it's one of the steps in sort of this this process of that that is thrown off in diabetes that is that is gone wrong essentially particularly in type two diabetes mm -hmm. type one diabetes mm -hmm. is a little different and at, um, at, first, at first blush for for people like me who are not biologists you the uh, the idea of saying oh it's perfectly natural to look in uh, in venoms to find useful pharmacological pharmacological proteins uh, and other things. And you convinced me that it was because of evolutionary and other other reasons, but see if you can convince us again. No, it really makes sense to look there for some of these answers because of the way we've evolved. Right, and it really makes sense because of the way they've evolved. So the idea of what a venom does is turn on or off or modulate processes in the body. That's what its its goal is. It's It's causing clotting. It's reducing clotting. It's you know, causing increase in blood pressure, reducing blood pressure. It's it's that those different toxins all have their little physiological roles. Something and, remarkably targeted usually too, right? Yeah, and so one of the things that ends up happening is when you think about it, um, if you have a toxin that targets, let's say it actually targeted all sodium channels on the planet, all varieties, you're gonna kill yourself. Right. <laughs> Right. Because you have sodium channels. And so a lot of these toxins, some of them are just sort of sequestered and they are susceptible to their own venoms. But in a lot of cases, they've modulated and, and adjusted it to just hurt something else or, or a group of animals that are not like themselves, often mammals, right. which <laughs> we happen to be. And so the, these toxins end up having very specific sort of narrow targets to make sure that they don't harm the animals themselves but they do harm the animals they want to harm. And this works for us whether it's targeting a mammal or something like an insect. So for example, there's a centipede toxin right now that they're working on that targets this one type, really targets this one type of sodium channel. It's a NAV 1.7. And it's, it's a channel that in insects is found basically all over. So when you inject the toxin into an insect, paralysis, death, on, <laughs> right? right. Uh, but in humans, that channel isn't everywhere. It isn't in our motor neurons. It mm. is in our pain neurons. Mm -hmm. And so this toxin effectively only shuts off pain neurons in, in mammals and in humans in particular. It has, and, and ideally, has no other effects. So it doesn't turn off any other neurons in the body. So you would have a, a very, very specific painkiller that would work at least if it all goes well, better than something like morphine without any of those nasty side effects. I mean, in something like morphine, one of the main problems with it is that it isn't a very specific toxin. Right. And it does cause things like your your breathing to slow, and it can affect your, like, and cause you to stop breathing. So, so morphine can be really dangerous for that reason. I mean, and it's addictive, but right. also really dangerous because because it becomes addictive, and then you take too much, and then you stop your breathing. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's only therapeutic in this really narrow window, whereas a toxin that hypothetically only targets pain neurons wouldn't have any other nasty side effects. Mm -hmm. You know, so you, you talked uh, about, um, I, don't, I don't remember if any plants were brought up, but we have bacteria and, of course, all, all manner of sea creatures, you know, invertebrates, vertebrates insects, you know, arachnids, uh, yeah, things with legs, things with, there did are. you, I must have missed there are, there are a couple of venomous plants. It takes a lot for a plant because they don't tend to attack. Right. <laughs> but there are a couple of the stinging nettles are considered venomous. Sure. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So actually speaking of specific species then, uh, someone on Twitter said, I needed to ask you about this particular <laughs> jellyfish. Uh, that would be Chironex fleckeri. It is the deadliest <laughs> jelly in the world, and it's a box jelly, um, and it is huge, and and that's part of why it's deadly. But the Chironex is is one of those animals that is just absolutely mind blowing because it's essentially a bag of goo. I mean, if you've ever felt a jelly bell, they're very soft. They're very. It's like a Jello. It's swimming Jello. Yeah. And, <laughs> 
And these animals can kill a full-grown adult human in less than five minutes. Wow. So they cause, um, rec they can cause, depending on the size of the sting or the amount of tentacle that is basically in contact, they can cause complete systemic failure, particularly heart failure, within five minutes or less. Wow. <laughs> and, and how big are they? Big as a chair, so, big as a car, big as a... <laughs> so the, the Chironex are the biggest box jelly in the world. Their bells get to be about the size of a basketball. Basketball, okay. So, and, but, but their tentacles are meters and meters of tentacle. I mean, and they've got 60 tentacles. Um, so there's 15 from each corner. And so there's meters and meters of, of tentacles, and there's tons in there, like, pretty, pretty good size. <laughs> so let me ask, what is your favorite venomous animal? <laughs> Ooh, that's a hard one. <laughs> that's a tough one. Although I, I do, I am partial to my lionfish. So I studied lionfish for my PhD, and and I do find them to be just amazing animals. I mean, when you think about, and unfortunately, nuisance animals right now, since they've decided <laughs> or were thrust into the Atlantic by us. Mm -hmm. um, so they've t come to take over the Atlantic and the Caribbean as, but. But what I love about them or I find really fascinating, I have this sort of evolutionary awe because here they are, they're gorgeous fish. They're, you know, pretty adaptable. They can handle a wide range of temperature, a wide range of salinity. Um, they're generalist predators. Basically anything that fits in their mouths, <laughs> they'll eat. <laughs> um, and, and they have this really potent, painful venom which makes them essentially off the menu for everything in the Atlantic and Caribbean, and we don't even know what actually eats them, if anything, in the Pacific. We're not even sure that predation is what keeps them in check. Interesting. So, Interesting. They're really incredible. I mean, there's just nothing that we know of that regularly eats lionfish. There's been a couple of, oh, we found one in the mouth of blah, 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 or in the stomach of blah, 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 but, but we don't know anything that just goes out and eats them. There's nothing that that's their regular prey. Right, because there's almost all other venomous animals have some sort of predator. Right, right. We can look at something and we talk about, you know, cobras and we talk about the mongoose that would eat it or, or you know, we've got these snake-eating eagles and we've got all of these other predators that, that would target a venomous snake, for example. We don't know of anything that eats stonefish, lionfish, scorpionfish. As far as we can tell, there isn't anything. <laughs> what about the cone snails? Uh, cone snails. Hmm. I, they are definitely eaten by other animals. I'm trying okay. to think of a specific example, but yeah, they're they're definitely more edible. Maybe each other actually, to a certain <laughs> extent. I was pretty impressed by the the platypus for many reasons, but large, most impressed I think when I discovered that when you told me that it has seasonal toxicity. Yep. So platypus are very interesting. Only the males are venomous. The females have no venom. Um, and it, it is seasonal. It's related to mating because they basically attack each other with these venomous hind leg spurs <laughs> to fight over fight over females. And at least in captivity, I don't know. We don't know a whole lot about it in the wild, but at least in captivity, they'll kill each other. So if you have two male platypus in captivity together during the breeding season, there is a decent chance that they will kill each other. Yeah. Um. So that it's a pretty pretty nasty toxin. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I only sort of knew that, but then when you said about the breeding, I thought, oh, I didn't know that. So I do <laughs> I do love it as a biologist, reading a biology-based book and going, thankfully, I didn't know this topic. <laughs> and I learned well, a lot. I learned so much from your book. See, you and I, I love that. That's, that my, yeah. my hope was that even seasoned biologists would find at least something in there that they didn't know. Well, yeah. Joanne, did you know about the Schmidt Pain Index? <laughs> I have heard of this pain index. <laughs> oh, speaking of a wonderful character in, in the Venom field, Justin yeah. Schmidt is absolutely one of a kind. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't sure that it carefully quantified, but it sure sounded interesting. Yeah, um, I mean, he's... If anyone would know how a sting feels, it would be him. <laughs> he actually wrote, he recently, this summer, published a book, uh, Sting of the Wild, which is, if you're, if you're into stinging insects and, and, and this pain index, you'll definitely want to check it out. 
Yeah, he sure. knows Amazon this. has recommended it to me. Yeah. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Wonder why. He's he's essentially played victim to a great number of a venomous animal, right? Yeah. And so he's something I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but dozens of different groups and <laughs> different species of of stinging insect, and then. I think he's also done it in different places with the same one to see where it hurts the most. Wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. I'll pass. Mm -hmm. you, you had, you've had a couple near misses yourself. Yeah. I love, I'm sorry, I love the bullet ant story. Yeah. That it would suddenly disappear. <laughs> I, I'm still nervous on my couch. It's not, so, I mean, the story for those of you who haven't read the book, of course. And you is, should read the book. You should read the book. <laughs> um, but I went to the Peruvian Amazon, um, thanks to uh, Jeff Kramer and Aaron Pomerantz and Rainforest Expeditions, which were great. And I come back, and I'm doing my laundry, and at the bottom of my washing machine, I find a bullet ant. And I'm... Pretty sure it's dead. I kind of I get it out using these long forceps I have to feed my puffer fish, and and I put it on a piece of paper on the table, and I'm like, oh, this is so cool. You know, I got the bullet ant, you know, souvenir without really trying. I'll I'll grab a vial of ethanol tomorrow from the lab, and I'll I'll put it in ethanol, and I'll have it forever as this sort of mm. like memento, right? Come back in the morning, and it is gone. <laughs> and there's no evidence that it or the paper have, like, moved. It's not like the paper's blown off onto some other. It's like the paper is just sitting there. So I'm hoping that, like, a cockroach thought it was a yummy meal some, for some reason and, like, dragged it off. <laughs> I thought yeah. it was dead. <laughs> yeah, so, so it'll just forever and ever be haunting you. <laughs> It'll be under the bed frequently at night. When I move out of this house, all of a sudden there will just be a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully dead. Hopefully, Hopefully just dead. dead. Well, that or I just introduced bullet ants to Hawaii, so you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, well you, you need more than one, so one shouldn't do anything terrible, I hope. So, um, you know, we've only got a few minutes left, and Christy, we don't want to miss out on you having the chance to say something we forgot to ask you about. So is there anything <laughs> else you would like to add before we end up saying goodbye? Ooh, um, goodness, we covered so much. Oh, I'll ask one thing real quick. Oh, sure. Do you hope to write another book? I, I like do. this one. I will I read really it. Do. I do. I, I don't want to, you know, count my chickens before they've hatched or anything, but I do think that... Poisonous might be a nice follow-up, for example. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. sort of explaining the other half of that big toxic world. Right. Oh, that would be very interesting. Well, I wish you luck on doing that. And uh, I think I read something somewhere that you your goal for writing this is for, for the rest of us to appreciate these creatures, too. Yes. I mean, I, I like I said, I, I really wanted to get across this respectful message. Mm -hmm. The idea that they, they are dangerous, they can be deadly, but they should be respected and, if anything, a little bit revered rather than feared. Right, like electricity. Have a healthy respect for it. Appreciate exactly. what it does, its place in our life, but don't go playing with it. Well, yes, certainly, exactly. Certainly <laughs> masters of biochemistry and we have a lot to learn from them. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they were very interesting creatures to read about. Yeah. So for those of you who have not yet picked up uh, Christie's book, I highly recommend it because I really enjoyed it. Jeff really enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed have it. A, yes, I, I'm speaking for you, Jeff, but yeah. I'm only quoting <laughs> you to talk to me about it. So anyway. <laughs> so anyway, if you have not picked up her book, go ahead and pick it up because it, it is a unique book in the area of biology and it's interesting to non biologists as well. Um, mm -hmm. and if you have a fear of these creatures, well, you should not leave being more afraid, but more mm -hmm. informed. So, Christy, thank you once again for joining us. We are so glad you could come here and talk about uh, this topic. It, you have such a passion for it. And the enthusiasm <laughs> you have really shows. I like it. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Great. Thanks, thank so, thank much. You so much. And thank you, thank Jeff, you, as always. And uh, thank you to everybody who watched us. Um, and um, our next guest will be Amy Shura Title and Natalia Holt on September 8th. Okay, we'll see you again soon. Okay, bye. <laughs>